D-Day at Omaha Beach, a game that came out a couple of years ago, has been very popular since. Uh, the first edition sold very well, in fact after a while they reprinted it, they made a second edition and this is the second edition. Unusual format for the box, sort of like landscape instead of portraits like most uh, lids of boxes so war games are. Uh, the topic, well it's pretty self-explanatory, it is the early days, even the early hours of the invasion of Normandy. Uh, the theme is therefore similar to that of another game that I also just played and reviewed, Breakout Normandy. But in Breakout Normandy, the early days, so the, the uh, the early hours of the invasion are part of the first turn. There's a special procedure there in the first turn to um, to simulate the landings. Here the landings are a big part. Half of the game is really the hours of the intense fighting on the pretty much you know by, by, by the sea really you had the sense of the of the men and the vehicles that are coming out of the water and fighting against the German fortified positions. Pretty much uh, say Private Ryan the game or at least the sense that you have is that you have in seeing the majestic fantastic um, amazing opening sequence of the movie say Private Ryan with that violence that intensity that uh, the brutality. This is what the game depicts. Now it's by decision games and decision games uh, can be a little bit hit or miss on various uh, on various fronts. Uh, the components uh, are not always particularly strong in their games. The rule box can be anywhere between very good to unreadable with errata that are three times as long as the as the rule box. This is a solid product of the fact that it was reprinted, had a second edition, should already tell you that, but just in case you have any doubt, the rule book is very well done, the components are, well the map looks a little weird, uh, anti-conventional I should say in a more neutral way, but it's not a, a bad map component-wise, it is well produced, it just looks unusual. Uh, there are the maps by decision games that look unusual, but just because that's they look weird without any need for it. Here there is a reason for the unusual look of the map. We'll talk about that. I want to reassure you that the rules and components in this game are very reliable. But how about the game itself? How about gameplay? Well, let's talk about that now. Here's the map of the game. It is printed on paper. You may place on the piece of plexiglass to make it lay flat if you think it doesn't do so enough, but I didn't have any problem playing the game with the map as is uh, without plexiglass. Clearly it shows the area of operations here. Here you have the areas that you will use to land your units. Well, here you place them when they're approaching uh, the landing site and then they will be placed, of course, on the beach. And from there they will move towards the northern side, trying to clear the defensive positions that the Germans have around the beach. Uh, other positions early on in the game are empty, but reinforcements will pop up uh, here and there in the map throughout the game. So your job as the player, playing the role of the allies, is to establish a strong presence in the area. Um, bring your headquarters on the beach, uh, turn them into command posts, place garrisons, uh, clear German positions, control key areas and if possible also get some of your units to exit the board from the northern uh, from the northern edge well it looks like it's the northern edge because we tend to see um, the top of the maps as the northern edge in truth it is the southern edge but that edge of the map in the game you control two divisions and your units are presented by these playing pieces you have infantry, tanks, rangers, a general, a general just fell, generals, headquarters, which later can be turned into command posts, artillery, you have a variety of units. Units have multiple steps, many units, especially infantry, have three steps, so when they take a hit you flip them to the other side with two steps left, and when they take a further hit you replace the counter with a corresponding counter. A counter with the same code but a single step on it. At that point the unit takes a further step, the unit is eliminated. 
Many units also have sets of letters printed on them. Those represent the weapons that the unit can bring to bear in a fight and this is particularly important. As for German units, they come in different flavors with a symbol representing what they can do, the type of unit that that is, a numerical value representing their strength, a set, sets of letters representing the type of weapons that the allies need to use to be uh, effective against them. And these units will be on the map, usually face down, face down. At the beginning of the game they're placed in these locations here, in some of these hexes here on the map. And also they may or may not be paired with depth with depth markers. Depth markers may add uh, uh, numbers, may add strength points and also add letters. That means that to be effective against that unit, a, a unit, a allied unit would need to be able to produce quote unquote those letters, would need to produce those weapons or those tactics. Some of those are not weapons but tactics. So this may be the situation, they may be German units that do not have a depth marker. The depth marker basically represents the optimal state of the German units, which is well placed, effective and ready to defend. Units that do not have a ready marker are not nearly as effective. So, how does a turn work? Well, the game can be seen almost as two games combined. The basic game uh, that covers turns from 1 to 16 and then the advanced game or the extended game that includes turns 17 to 32. And you can play the, the extended game as a game in its, on its own, as a scenario that starts later in the day. Or you can connect the two in a single large scenario or you can also just play the early scenario, turns 1 to 16 with the initial landings and the initial fights on the beach. So first we're going to talk about the basic game, the one that revolves around uh, landing and taking control of the German locations that are right by the sea. So pretty much what you see in the opening sequence in, in say Private Ryan. Each turn in the basic game starts with the amphibious operation phase for the for the ally player, and that would be, you remember, I'm just putting units here kind of randomly, don't don't worry about me. Actually talking about, I mean, don't worry about things being too accurate. Um, actually, something that I did not mention is the is the, some of the symbols on the units. Units have a number that represents their strength value, if it is the only number there. If there are two values, the first is strength, the second is range, so Units with two numbers are range units, and some units have unlimited range. Also, you see these symbols here. These are the target symbols. They're extremely important because, well, they, they allow game effects to target specific types of units. So units with a triangle or units with a diamond, units with a circle will be targeted by game effects in different ways. So first we have the amphibious operation phase when you draw a card for each sector of the board. The board is divided in two sectors, uh, one is here, one is there. So each sector is usually handled separately, which is also why the game can be so easily played by two players that are each taking control of a different sector and each taking control of a different division. For each sector you draw a card and during the landing operation phases you only look at the top table at the top uh, stripe, top area of the card. What does it mean? It means that uh, in the sector that I am checking, units that have a diamond symbol will suffer a C result, triangle symbol an A result, uh, circle a B result. And what does that mean? Well, to identify that we take a player aid that tells us the effects that happens in the amphibious phase during the landing. So suppose we're in turn three, we look at this section that corresponds to the turn that we are, we're checking for infantry, we're using this card, that means that in the sector that I'm checking, units that infantry that has the diamond will suffer the C effect, drift nine boxes east. Infantry that has a triangle will suffer the A effect, drift four boxes each, 
and in infantry with the circle will suffer the B effect. So you can see things can be shuffled around. A triangle unit, so a unit marked with a triangle may experience one effect this turn and another effect the next. So usually during the amphibious landing tables, this is most of what happens that the units drift around. After you have moved them uh, and drifted them as as it's required, then you finally get to land them. You enter them in the area that the that the arrow is pointing to. Later in the game, later in the day, the tide will rise. There are lines that indicate the mid tide, mid tide, and high tide, and then the landing will happen directly on the tide line for that turn. Then you add to these boxes the units that you have received this turn as reinforcements even though they'll have to sit there for, for now, they're traveling to the beach and so they'll be uh, checked for amphibious landing effects and they will join the board next turn. After the amphibious landings we have the event phase, self-explanatory you draw a card, then you look at the section corresponding to the turn that you're playing and you resolve the effect. So that marker may be added, your units may be upgraded and become hero, for example, like in this case, all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of things may happen. As you can see, uh, there may be different subdivisions uh, of the possible, of, of the span of turns in the game, depending on different cards and they have different effects. So you resolve an event each turn during the basic game, later in the extended game uh, you resolve two. Then you have, alas, the much feared the German five phase, where for each of the two sectors of the beach, for each of the divisions that you are landing, uh, you have to take fire. For each uh, sector, for each half of the board, you draw a card, and this time we'll look at this um, at the bottom here. The symbol indicates the targets for this round of fire. These are the type of units, uh, the ones marked with a circle that the, the Germans are firing at during this phase. That would be, in our example, that would be that unit. These are the colors of the positions that are fire, firing. Ignore the letters for now, those are used mainly in the extended game. Just look at the number of squares and the colors. Uh, two squares mean that only German positions of that color and the depth marker get to fire. These are the ones, the symbols with a single, with a single um, square mean that all positions of that color, whether with the depth marker or not, get to fire. As you can see, oh, for example here the purple unit would get to fire. And we get to fire that unit because it is circular and because this unit is within the range of fire of that unit. You see these nets of circles that depart from the German position, those indicate the areas that the front unit can cover. And the intensity of fire can change. Uh, a full, a solid circle means that is an X that receives steady fire, actually receives intense fire from that position. This means steady fire and this means sporadic. So this unit now is taking steady fire from that unit, from, from that position. And simply repeat like that for all uh, positions uh, that apply, that have been identified by the card firing at all targets that have been identified. Also some uh, cards uh, during the German fire phase may force you to check for artillery fire, in which case you check if you if the number of units marked with, this, with the caliber indicated on the card is equal to or higher than this number, so in this case if we have four or more units that uh, have this caliber here, then you have one of your units becomes the target of artillery. But to resolve fire, back to fire, there is a play rate for that. You look at the German fire chart, which is really self-explanatory. You simply cross the type of unit that is firing with the uh, with the symbol on the on the X of the unit that is being fired at. In this case, for example, we have a unit that is being targeted in an area with steady fire from a WN position. It's a non-armor unit, uh, and so it simply loses a step. The non-armor units with a target symbol indicated on the fire card lose a step. That, boom, simple. 
that unit will say was not activated by our card or maybe it was activated and there weren't any enemy units with the correct symbol so they didn't get to fire but uh, don't think you're gonna be so lucky these units fire a lot they hit a lot you're gonna take a lot of damage a lot of fire as you land as it very well should be given the topic after you resolve fire for both halves of the board, finally you have an engineer face where you get to place clear markers on the board to clear the beach from some of the, uh, the anti-tank protections that the Germans have placed there. So you put these markers there. And finally you get the US phase. Now during the US phase, uh, uh, initially you don't get to do much. The rule says that you get to activate two units for each of your divisions, so two units of the division that comes from here and two units of the division that comes on that side of the board. Activating four units after you did all that stuff doesn't seem like much and early on that's pretty much all you can do. Uh, your people just landed, there's so much chaos and confusion, everybody's paralyzed, yes, they're not achieving much. Luckily enough, as this nice play rate also tells us, there are free actions, there are units that get to act for free on top of those basic two units per division per turn. And these are units that are rangers, so ranger units always act for free. Units that are stacked with a hero marker, units that are inspired, that have an inspired marker, or units that are in command of a general or HQ. So this is really important. These units, these pieces, the HQs and the generals are really vital. And you really get the sense of the general that just landed and is there, stays there, and it's encouraging people because units that land around him, they get to move for free. So you really have the sense that he's directing them and telling them what to do. And of course, the, the further they go, then they, if they go far, they don't benefit from that. But you start moving the general. So a general like in this area, they can instruct people that just landed and people that are entering, that are leaving the beach to attack the Germans. That's a good position. So uh, there are nice interesting choices on uh, how to use and where to place your headquarters and generals and this is really key because you need to maximize your free actions, you need to maximize what you can do. So you will have actions between the standard ones and the free ones uh, and the actions that you can perform, again these very good, this very good player it tells us what they are. You can move a single hex, you may attack, you may, you may climb by buff or a cliff, some of those take longer to do you may perform a barrage if you have a if you have if you activate for this action a unit that has a range attack like artillery preservation move is a move that will bring you to a safer place or towards a safer place units may also get disrupted and removing the disruption marker marker is the is for free uh, in truth, that is all you can do. So all that happens is that if you receive the disruption marker that turn, you cannot do anything, but as a free action, you get to remove it at the end. Moving, uh, we'll now get into the details of climbing, etc, etc. There are markers to mark units that are climbing. It may take several turns if you're climbing a particularly steep area. What I'm sure you're curious to know is about combat. All right, when you need to resolve combat, so you check this chart here, the US result chart. Remember I said that these German units have weapons that they require, you need to have them to be effective against them. So first, when you're attacking, you check if the units that you're using for the attack have the necessary, have the necessary weapons. In this case, that unit has a BG and we have, no, we don't have a BG here. Suppose that a unit is also joining the attack. Yes, so we have all of the required weapons for now. But you see, there's also an unrevealed depth marker. So we look at the chart and we look at the area for the US attackers that have all of the required weapons. Yes, hooray, check. Uh, what is our strength? Less, equal, higher, higher and double than the opponent. So if these two people are attacking, 10 versus 2, we we'll look at this line here. And we cross-reference what, what it is that we're attacking. We're attacking a German unit with an unrevealed depth marker. Well, we reveal the depth marker and then we compare again and we see if we still have the, the right weapons. And uh, DE, do we have it? Yes, we do happen 
to have it. So again, we go back to our table. Yes, double, but now we're looking at the column for German units and reveal depth marker. And here we have the effect, which can be uh, the marker is eliminated, unit is disrupted, the marker depth marker eliminated, and unit is defeated. So sometimes it takes you several turns, especially if you show up at the party with the wrong weapons, then it's painful because you need to figure out ways of bringing weapons there, bring them from other units, I mean, summon units that have them. A hero stack with a unit can be used to replace, to count as any, any weapon requirement. So there are ways of doing it, but it's really, it's interesting because you have surprises, because you have an unpredictable aspect to that. It's a fun, simple uh, combat system. And it's pretty much very self-explanatory. It's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure type of thing. You go through all the possible choices, uh, depending on the circumstances, and you apply the effect. The idea is show up in big numbers with the right weapons. But showing up in with the right with the right weapons in big numbers is dangerous because these people do keep firing. Remember all of those dots that you see are areas where you take fire and some areas are covered by fire from various positions. So it can be pretty bad. A good way of increasing your chances of surviving, of having your units uh, arrive uh, where they can attack successfully, is to use Barrage. And again, Barrage is one of the actions that is possible. And Barrage, pretty much like combat, is resolved in, I would say, self-explanatory way. You look at this table, I don't really need to... I don't... this is not a rule, just look at the table and do what the table says. Uh, what you well actually there is one rule that is when you're resolving barrage you draw a card and you look if the color of the position that you're attacking with your barrage is represented there and if the symbol of the unit that is barraging is there we will say for example that this unit here is barraging against that unit, so then we need to take into account the symbol of the barraging unit, that would be a circle, and the color of the position that is being attacked, which is orange. Uh, this would be pretty bad because I don't have the symbol and I don't have the color. So that's it, once you have those uh, pieces of information, you look here and you see. Uh, if you have nothing, if you only have the barraging unit's target symbol, if you only have the German position scholar, or if you have both, and then depending on the strength of the unit that is barraging, you will see what the result is. Usually the result is nothing or disruption. You need to be very lucky to be able to also remove a depth marker from a unit that you are attacking with barrage. But it's good enough because you combine barrage attacks this dis that disrupt the units and that allows your infantry units to get closer and to then deliver the attack that they need to clear the position. So you really see combined arms here. Combined arms when it comes to different type of units that have to bring different weapons to the to the appointment to the combination of um, of barrage and and advances to protect your advancing men and increases your chances of being able to clear the German positions that you're attacking. The rules we discussed are the ones for the first wave scenario or for the first part of the extended game that covers uh, not just the landings but also the next phase of of expansions towards German positions that are not immediately on the beach. If you are playing the scenario that starts here directly or continuing, then the game changes. The game works in different ways. Now each turn covers more time. It represents half an hour instead of 15 minutes, and so more stuff happens. The amphibious subterrations remains the same. You have two event phases to cover for the fact that in half an hour more stuff can happen. You have the German fire phase where the Germans fire more. They produce more volume of fire. Then you have a US engineer in HQ phase, which is very important, is when you convert um, HQs, for example, to command posts, uh, and uh, they, they acquire new abilities, they can do more stuff for you. And then we have the action phase, where you get three actions per turn, three standard actions per turn, instead of two only. The range of HQ command posts is bigger, is, is longer, longer range than the one of the regular HQ, so that also is good because that also gives free actions to more units. 
But the biggest change to me is the fact that now the Germans do a lot of other stuff. Yes, you can do some extra stuff, but the Germans in the early scenario just sat there and fired, which made perfect sense given the theme and the context. Uh, but now they get more creative. So the letters that you see in the cards when you resolve their attacks matter too. Not just the color, not just the number of squares, but also the letters. P means that an occupied reinforcement position may patrol. They are conducting small operations around their position and they disrupt uh, uh, American units around them. A, an occupied reinforcement position may advance. An unoccupied reinforcement position may ambush. Yes, even unoccupied positions may act. Well, in this case specifically means that they were there already. Pickable, you did not expect them, so you got ambushed. You thought it was unoccupied, didn't you? An unoccupied, an occupied WN position may conduct artillery fire. M, an occupied reinforcement position, we know US units in its field may conduct mortar fire. And then you may have positions that may resupply or redeploy or reinforce or even reoccupy. For each of these, there are specific rules. There is a section. I don't think we need to get um, in detail here. You can pause the video and have a look at some of these rules and see what these actions do, how you resolve them. The fact that now the Germans are getting more creative, more unpredictable. The tactics are more complex, and so you have more things that you have to worry about. First, it was just about disrupt those darn positions as you advance your people. Now it is deal with the Germans running around like crazy, uh, right and left. Or no, no, actually they don't move physically very much, but they just you just feel that their action has a larger extent, and they look like they're doing more stuff and running around. You feel like the actions that happen on the board are the result of abstract movements that you do not physically see on the board. HQs can become command posts, engineer units can become uh, engineer can become engineer bases with more abilities and more capabilities. But this is pretty much these are the main differences. And of course you have winning and losing conditions, which are which is pretty much about making sure that you occupy that you occupy uh, the key points on the map, that you move units outside of the map, and most importantly, that you do not lose too many units. Both in the basic first wave scenarios and in the extended game, you win if you occupy certain scenarios, but also you need to survive. You lose the game easily, easily if you suffer a catastrophic loss, and the catastrophic loss in truth is not that hard to get. The number of units that you need to have reduced or to lose to suffer a catastrophic loss is really not high. This is a game that uh, that is very original. It's a solid game that feels like no other, at least no other game that I that I played. No other D-Day game. I haven't played them all. I'm making an educated guess, but definitely no game that I played had this as this feel here. And and this is interesting because I did play a lot of games that rely on a similar idea uh, for the AI. When you have an AI in a solitaire game, very often it is either like rolling dice on a table to see what the opponents are doing or drawing drawing chits from a cup or drawing cards from a deck. It's a very popular idea. We had it in Harkham Motor already, maybe even in earlier games. So it's a very well it's a very well known way of creating an AI. Recently played Night of Men by Flying Pigs uh, Pig uh, Productions. It has that same idea. And yet there's something about the way this AI does it that, does, that, that feels different. Because the mechanics can be the same, but of course the way it is implemented is what really um, tells you about the quality of the game. And if you look for comments on this, on this game uh, that has been around for a while, so there has been already a lot of talk about this game, people will say that the AI feels freakishly disturbingly human and I can only confirm that is my impression too. Um, it's strange with the exception that you cannot have a conversation with it. It really feels like playing with an experienced war gamer that has a very clear idea what the best ways of punishing you for everything you do are. 
uh, that gets distracted from time to time and you have to patiently wait for for that opportunity. There is a certain organic feel to the way that different positions operate that the ally that the, 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 that the Germans bring in reinforcements and they get settled in the reinforcements, they improve their position. Um, there's just something incredibly um, dynamic and organic that really gives you the sense that this is an artificial intelligence, intelligence um, being the meaningful word here, that really you get the sense that you are playing against a program that has been programmed very well, even though by analog means, not digital ones, and to respond to your actions and to present you with challenges and with, with strings of actions and reactions. It's, it's impressive. It's a solitaire that really feels like you're playing a two-player game against an invisible an invisible player. Um, as for the game itself, uh, I really like the intensity of the first of the first part of the game, which also is the part of the game that feels most original. Later, yes, it's um, it's also is disturbing to see how when, when the AI starts doing more more different things, more varied things. It's also impressive to see how. Uh, how the variety is handled. But in a certain sense, the game almost feels a little more traditional. I'm moving around, I'm trying to establish positions, etc. But that first half of the game, where you're just there, uh, reaching the shores, so running against those positions, hoping that the bombardment uh, weakens them as you're sending your men to die, um, it has a certain intensity, a certain pace, a certain personality, which feels very very unique, very different. I mean, other games where you maneuver on a map, negotiate terrain, um, and control positions, uh, that's what most war games are about. And in a sense, the, the, the first part of the game is you're changing, trying to take control of the defensive position of the Germans soon after the landings is also that, but it's done in a concentrated way. It's almost like a distillation of war gaming. And maybe just, and you're just playing on a very small strip of access, but since every hex counts so much, every um, decision moving to one hex rather than another means so much, has such huge effects, can affect you so much, can lead you to catastrophic losses so quickly. In fact, at the beginning of the game you're using a small part of the map, but everything is magnified because of that, because how important the decisions are on that small area. There's just something about that part of the game uh, that makes it my favorite part of the game. Um, even if there wasn't the extended game, that was all the game, I, I'd be happy. I think, I would say this is a game that would be worth the price of admission. Even if you were are scared of all the extra procedures that you have to learn to play the extended game with all the other actions, you would just be buying it for the, for the landing game. Uh, I think you that would be I think it would be a good deal. I think it could it would be a good investment. It's a game that is intense, that it has intense action. It has it somehow it seems to capture some of the emotional element of the story. Again, really um it reminded me so much of the opening sequences of Saving Private Ryan, like every minute. From precisely like in the movie, you have the first sense of shell shock when you have the sense that you're not doing anything, that the action is progressing without you. Everybody around you is dying and you're just standing there and not doing much because at the beginning there's just so little that you can do. Finally, then um, you start advancing, you start acting, and you get mowed down as you do it. And you and you get the sense that, oh, wow, what a great difference. Now I'm getting killed as I move instead of as I stand. So much better. And then finally slowing, very slowly, precisely like in the movie, uh, painfully, in a painfully slow way, finally you get to destroy your first position. And when you do get to clear the first position, it's a huge is a huge relief for you. And then again, slowly, almost without realizing it's some more positions, uh, get cleared. Again, each is a big achievement, but actually at a certain point you look at the board and realize that at some point the tragedy ended. At some point, it is hard to exactly pinpoint as it happens, the tide turn, and now finally your people are landing and, and fewer of them are getting are getting killed as they land and, and, your, and your objective starts switching now uh, towards like 
uh, conquering positions, I mean, uh, establishing strong position, creating a line from which you will then depart into exploring and taking control of other areas on the board. Uh, it has this fluid moment that goes from uh, horror and complete sense of impotence that you have to taking control of an area of the board and suddenly expanding towards that. So maybe that is what is it? That that is that is what it makes this game so different. At the beginning it doesn't really feel like a war game almost. It feels just like, like a slaughter. It feels like, like a horror movie. And it switches and slowly progresses into becoming a war game. While of course remaining in essence a war game all along, uh, there is something in the in the narrative which is very strong. It's very absorbing. It's really immersive and gives this game a pretty unique quality. The day at Omaha Beach. If you haven't tried it, give it a try. Start with the landing game, and even if you then stop there, I think you'll still be happy that you gave a chance to this game. Um, game that has sold very well, is very well known in the industry, in the wargaming community, and there are good reasons for that.